Hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining us after lunch. So we're going to be have a very important task of making sure no one falls asleep. Um, my name is Monica Ugui. I'm responsible for the product and design teams at Rotterstack, which is a customer data platform. And so let's start by introducing ourselves. Why don't we start from you, Vijay? Sure. Uh, my name is Vijay Umapathy, and I'm a director of product at Heap. Uh, we're a digital insights product, and we help you understand the customer journey and make it better. Uh, my name's Niels Boat. I head up growth and automation solutions at Trade.io. Um, for those of you who don't know, Trade.io is a low-code integration and automation platform. Um, we know that integration is really important to product teams and that, um, unfortunately, the overhead of delivering your, on your integration roadmap is often quite high. And so our goal is to help you deliver on your integration roadmap much faster. I'm Evan Michener. I'm really excited to be in the same room with a whole bunch of product people, too. This is great. <laughs> uh, I'm the head of product at Full Story, uh, where we do digital experience intelligence. So we're combining the quantitative with the qualitative to help uh, teams uh, make decisions faster. All right. OK, so <laughs> we're going to be talking about digital transformations. But this is a really com complex concept. So in the interest of 30 minutes, Let's narrow it down to talking about how data plays a role in digital transformations. So hopefully that little curveball does not cause any <laughs> chaos for us. And um, so let's start with the first question. What role have you seen data playing in helping companies along the data majority journey? Um, yeah, I could start. So I think, uh, I can, first I'll explain a little bit about how we think about data maturity at Heap. Um, so it's actually not just about tools or about the data itself. It's about tools, people, and processes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, at one end of the spectrum, you have the, the organizations ruled by the hippo, right? This is the highest paid person's opinion is making all your decisions. You as a PM are kind of getting yanked around, right? It's no fun for anyone. Um, on the other end of the spectrum or the, the promised land, right, is, uh, is a world where you've built this machine um, that generates reliable improvement in your business. That's increased revenue, reduced costs. And that comes as a result of understanding and quantifying opportunities up front, making a portfolio of investments, and then having some portion of that portfolio pan out, right? And people are all over the spectrum, you know, you know, in between these two states. And so in terms of where data can help, I think step one is understand customer behavior. That's the backbone, in my opinion, is, is what are your customers doing? What are they not doing? And where are they getting stuck? What do you guys think? Yeah, that makes sense to me. I, I think there's maybe a, uh, another sort of way we could think about framing it, particularly for this audience. Like you guys are the face of digital transformation for, for many of the companies that are your customers. And uh, in some sense, like data is uh, the, the love language of digital transformation, right? Like it's the common that. thing that, that binds, right? It's both um, a, a sort of the blessing and the, the product of it, and but also like a huge challenge, right? So if you think about um, some of the organizations where digital transformation is like a major thing for them, healthcare, um, uh, highly regulated industries, like this is very scary to them, right? And, and they need your vision and your guidance, like you're doing things in a fundamentally different way than they are. And, and they're trying to figure out how to tackle it and your experience and how to think differently about democratizing your data, about open platforms and open systems and, and you know, prioritizing that for them is, is extremely important. Uh, and just you know, being pretty sensitive to the fact that they're very concerned about the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the health of their data. We all are as well, but, but, but it's particularly um, important for them. Well, I'll, I'll build on that a little bit. I mean, who here feels like they have their data under control? <laughs> Great. Glad we're talking about this. I think, I mean, when we talk about digital transformation, I completely agree with, with both of you. I mean, you're talking about the willingness to kind of challenge how you're creating value today, which is applicable whether your company's 100 years old or in healthcare or something else, or you're literally in a day-old startup. 
So it's constantly trying to leverage the latest technology and, and data is central and, and core to that. And then making that data accessible to different teams in different ways. So let's get rolling. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> so um, first question is what best practices or what advice do you have for product managers to be at the forefront of chairing their teams to accelerate um, their path again on the data maturity journey or to adopt a transformative digital setup? Cool. Um, so I got a whole bunch. I'll preface this with that. And uh, if you want to talk about like 50 other ones, come find me at the booths afterwards. But um, I'll tell you about one um, that I'm super excited about that we've been using a lot recently, which we call the work backwards plan. Um, and so essentially what this is, is you can think of it as a lightweight financial planner um, for your quarter and for hitting your OKRs. Um, and so, by the way, important thing to think about too for all of you is if you're kind of living in a world where your OKRs are like ship this feature or do this, you know, do this thing that's like kind of zero or one, I either like push the code or I didn't push the code and it doesn't have a tie to, to impact, then at some point you really want to start revisiting those goals and trying to orient them as clearly as you can to business impact and ideally revenue, I would say. Um, and so let's say, for example, you do have a goal that's oriented to business impact like revenue. Um, the whole idea with the work backwards plan is that you're not in this intermediate state where your quarter consists of one bet that is trying to drive that impact. And by the way, it's good to make progress to be in that state. Um, but you want to get to a place where you have like three or five of these bets. And if any two or three of them pan out, then you are going to reliably hit your goals, right? And so what a work backwards plan does is you, you look at all the different things that you want to change. You look at what the impacted population is, right? What's the reach of those changes? Um, and then you start to rank things based on, uh, this starts to actually, this, skew, this is skewed heap towards um, orienting ourselves towards smaller changes that are further up in the funnel um, and that are reaching far more users. And it's allowing us to achieve smaller bits of incremental improvement far more reliably than before we were using this tool. So that's why it's kind of my favorite pet tool of the moment. But we can talk about lots more later. Um, so I think the question was, what advice might we have for product teams who are thinking about helping companies? Best practices. Yeah. So Best specifically practices. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so I evaluate a lot of tools. Um, <laughs> and I actually often start in uh, developer docs. So I, I'm a huge, huge, huge advocate for highly open platforms, right? So you better give me all the webhooks and all the rest APIs. I want to be able to do everything that I can do inside your application through an API. Um, and I want really good documentation, uh, not gated, highly available, highly open, because honestly, like th there are just um, so many people on the front lines of um, different types of businesses. And there's different types of ways that those businesses are trying to um, work and make your product work with inside their organization. And it takes a very open mindset and, and you don't know how they're going to do it. So you better be pretty open and um, both sort of technically speaking and documentation wise on how to actually like interface with um, that open platform that you're creating. Yeah. Well, I'll add one other uh, flavor on top of both of those. And it's, you need somebody to champion data. It might be you, <laughs> whether you like it or not. But you need somebody in your organization to champion exactly what we're talking about here, which is getting that data open, accessible, making sure people trust it, know how to get to it, uh, so that teams can move faster. And uh, one of the things that we try to do at Full Story is make, make that as easy as possible for you. Uh, so since we have a room of, of product folks here, you know, the last time that you shipped a feature or capability and then the next day you realize, oh, I forgot to tag it. And all of a sudden you're missing analytics and missing measurements and CEOs asking what the numbers are and you don't know. That's one of the things we try to do at, at Full Story is help the data champion out. We use a technology called auto capture, which means you don't need to explicitly tag and instrument all of these things. So it's one less thing that data champion needs to work for. But that's, I guess, just one practical bit of advice is you need somebody internally to help champion the data. That's such an important point. I actually want to drill in further, and we'll start with you, Evan. 
the concept of having a champion is crucial to having broad scale change happen on teams. So now very specifically to product managers, how do you, how as a product manager, how do you influence your entire team to rally around a goal? Let's say it's it, you're trying to up-level your data platform. Well, I'll take a stab here. It's not unlike what we do every day, which is building product piece by piece by piece. And you're kind of decreasing risk and increasing confidence as you go. So I, I, mean, I guess my encouragement is just look at it like you're building a product. If your product is building trust in the data. Great. Yeah. Um, so I can, uh, I'm, I might take a slightly different take on it, right? So uh, I think there's a, um, there's a bit of a skills gap out there. And so we've all um, gotten to this point where data is highly portable, right? So, so it's, it, there's this sort of great abstraction happening, right, with customer data platforms where they're sort of acting as a hub to be able to facilitate and move it around and all these sorts of things, right? It's, it's far more accessible than it is today, but if you get like on the front lines of an organization, um, what you'll find is that there, there's still a lot of walled garden mentality where, where there's uh, pe people who, who really see the promise of, of what's possible, uh, particularly, again, in some of these legacy organizations where they're just dealing with all kinds of um, uh, challenges in using their data. So there's a lot of uh, people who see the promise, but we haven't prioritized the skill sets on how to actually work with it. Like, how do I work with an API? How do I write some basic SQL? And that skills gap is applicable both to these big organizations trying to do digital transformation, but it's applicable, honestly, in a lot of uh, product organizations, like product operations folks, there's a huge, huge opportunity for them to become more literate on, on using data and take advantage of some of these new, far more accessible platforms on how to get it and move it around and orchestrate process. And if, if we prioritize those skill sets, like you're going to find that that innovation and the digital transformation is going to, it's going to snowball. So I think we, we need to start prioritizing teaching more people the skill sets required to take advantage of it. Yeah. We did. Yeah, and I think, um, I think I would say a couple of things that I'd, that I'd add to those, right? One is um, I think it's really important to find a good foothold um, mm -hmm. in terms of a pain point. It's really, really easy with data to boil the ocean and try and solve all of your company's data problems at once, and I've never seen anyone do it successfully. Um, and so I recommend that you figure out, you know, what is a dire problem um, that you want to solve? And, and I'd say also, don't just think about the product team. Um, think about the constellation of teams that, sur that surround product, right? So you have customer success, you have support, you have growth marketing, right? All these teams are very adjacent to product management. And oftentimes when you're, you know, you're setting up the set of tools and processes uh, to up level, you're actually benefiting more than one persona, more than one group here. Um, so think about, uh, think about both of those when you're figuring out your foothold um, of how to start delivering impact. And you'd be surprised how quickly you can scale up from there. Such great advice. I really like um, an underlying thread here, which is, when we think about data, we're getting so much better at extracting tons and tons of data. There are all these companies that are building amazing products to process. Um, and so it seems very logical that we should use data to make decisions, at least to inform decisions. But I have noticed as a product manager, it's really important to remember that you're trying to drive change. You're trying to tr change the behavior of your team. And so even though you're talking about something very logical, it's still important to understand you're dealing with human beings on your team that may not be familiar with all the new systems or all the new ways to gather data. And so make sure your EQ ears are perked and you're understanding all of the stakeholders, all of the different parties on your team that might be having resistance, get to the fear or the source of concern and make sure you address that. And don't assume that it's gonna be a no-brainer to push forward like your strategy. But amazing, that leads me to our third question, which is 
What's your advice for combining qualitative and quantitative signals in decision making? Sure. Um, so I can, I can start to take this one. I think that, uh, I, so first of all, I would say that qualitative and quantitative data are extremely complementary, um, but they have different strengths. So I think quantitative data is much better at helping you find out where you want to focus, right? The customer journey can be very broad. Your customer segments can be very varied. Um, and it is really easy if you start with just individual anecdotes to find yourself in a situation where you're fixing something that was frustrating one person but didn't actually impact your business as a whole. And if you rinse and repeat and scale that out, you get largely nothing. Um, and so it's really important, um, in my opinion, to start with using quantitative data and quantitative tools to help you figure out where you want to focus. And then qualitative tools really shine, in my opinion, at helping give you ideas for what you actually want to do about it, right? What experiments do you want to run? What do you want to change? It's so much easier to step into the user's shoes and actually experience what they saw um, to, to help you get to that next step of, okay, here's the experiment I want to run. Um, and so they're, they're very complementary in that way. Okay. And full stories kind of started on the other side of that, more on the qualitative, so starting with session replay, where you're observing what the user's doing, which is kind of the ultimate empathy generator, by the mm -hmm. way, kind of like you mentioned, PJ. So, uh, and then we've moved into the quantitative as well over the past couple of years. The power of that is that you can get in there and see, oh, here's a problem or here's a bug or here's a friction point somewhere where the user's gotten frustrated or you have an opportunity to improve that and then immediately say, what's the scope? Like, what's the impact of this thing? So you're hopping directly into the quantitative view of that qualitative piece. So that's, I mean, the, the power of quantitative and qualitative is together, you know? Uh, and huge full story fan, by the way, uh, we're customers and I, I think you're a thousand percent correct. Like th there's really interesting platforms now. Full story is a great example where you're layering both qualitative, right? You have a visual sense of what somebody's actually doing with quantitative and how fast is the screen reacting and where are the error points happening. Um, Gong's another great example of this. Gong is like my favorite qualitative tool yep. ever. Right? You can literally get in there and hear in your customers' words exactly what they're saying when they're first coming into the funnel versus what's happening when their account manager is talking to them a, a year later. And, and so I, I, I'm, I tend to be of the mind that like qualitative is where I tend to start. And, and then I use quantitative to basically validate the qualitative insight. And, and so if I'm hearing a pattern that keeps coming up on a gong call or seeing something that keeps up being, coming up in full story, then I can develop that into a hypothesis and then go find the data and say like, okay, you know, edge case or common, right? And, and it truly is a, um, uh, those two things converging that um, makes for good insight. So, so absolutely like get out there, listen, watch the full story sessions, put it together, come up with your hypothesis, validate it through quantitative and whatever you change, then measure also after. Yeah, and, and Gong's a great example too, you know, on the, whether it's customer support or on the sales side, being able to talk to a user and then immediately tie that back to what they were just doing on your mobile apps or website. That's like, it, the whole world opens up because all of a sudden you're actually seeing what the user's talking about instead of trying to play that translation game. So. Yeah. Yeah, actually I really like I like Gong. I think one thing one thing I would also mention too is um I think surveys are, and voice of customer is mm. a really underrated channel. Um I think a lot of times often people will jump to um you know they'll jump to like starting with customer interviews which I think is Great, it's the accessible thing, especially when you have a sales team. Um, it doesn't involve learning any kind of new tool because um, you're just getting on a call face to face. Um, but it is really time consuming. I think I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, if you have access to some level of scale, I think surveys are really powerful um, in terms of speed, low effort, low time commitment um, if you need a decision on a relatively rapid time scale. Um, and I think also just, uh, just to speak a little bit more to the idea of speed. Um, I think an important thing 
especially when you think about qualitative data, is、um, the rituals that you have in place, like the weekly watch session meetings and things like that. It's really important to think about how much time you're spending preparing for those moments of insights versus the time that you're spending experiencing them. Um, it's it's crucial to find yourself in a situation where you're not spending three hours of time to prepare for like ten seconds of value,、um, and so、uh, that's that's where I think a lot of times the merging of that quantitative and qualitative is really important because the quantitative can help reduce that search time, so you can get to those moments of value a lot faster. I like to point on the rituals, like key. key. In surveys as well, right? Like distribute that information very publicly.、Mm-hmm. Like I think in some of the organizations I've been in, like there's like one group who's responsible for like combing through the survey data and then like distilling that into insight.、Yeah. And again, that's that walled garden kind of mentality to that qualitative data. Like put it in a Slack channel. Like literally every time that somebody fills out that survey, it needs to be in a public Slack channel,、mm-hmm. and every time like this keyword shows up in Gong, like link it straight in that same public Slack channel, Slack channel, so people can watch it, right? And 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 create a culture in which people are just throwing that insight out there because you never know what people what. Information people actually don't have. A lot、mm-hmm. of people inside of an organization don't have direct customer insight, and so distributing that out to them in a very public manner is a ritual that, and cultural precedent that I think like you should all be thinking about. No,、oh. I love this idea of speed too, because I mean, looping back to the original question around digital transformation, the intersection of data, speed is a metric of success that you can use internally. Like how quickly. Can you act on an insight, quantitative or qualitative learning? And that's—I mean—that's the product loop: is learn and act, learn and act, learn and act. So speed might be one of those metrics of success as you look internally. To is the data out there? Do people know how to get to it?、Uh, is it accessible? Is it trustworthy? Do people are they going to spend the next ten minutes arguing about whether it's the right data or is it accurate?、Um, so speed, crucial measure of success. Yeah. Amazing. Well, we're right about time, so I'm going to ask you one last question. You have a massive audience in front of you. What advice do you have for aspiring product managers, even regardless of data specifically? Yeah,、um, I think I think the number one thing I would say is、uh, try to spend some time thinking like your CEO and thinking、mm-hmm. like your investors. Um, and and what that means is, don't just think about the domain or the feature or the page or whatever that you start out in your organization owning, because that's going to change over time. All of that's going to feel like a blip on the radar in the rearview mirror, like as the years go by, and your scope of ownership is going to increase. But if from day one you understand how does your company generate revenue, how does it tick? How do your digital experiences feed into that? How does my page in this workflow and this part of the customer journey drive impact for my business? And you view and op- you view your job and you operate with that lens. You're going to climb that ladder a hell of a lot faster than everybody else.、Um, so, so that's my advice to you: is zoom out and think like your CEO and your investors. So I've had the privilege of meeting a, a few of you, especially on the aspiring side of this. And it's one of my favorite. Conversations to have, you know. So my, I guess I would. I love that, BJ too.、Um, I would encourage you to keep the curiosity alive. So much of product work is like the core DNA is curiosity. Are you staying curious about the customer, about your product, especially if it's a product that you happen to use every day? How do you stay curious about that so you don't overlook the speed bumps that your users are feeling? And and for the、uh, the aspiring PMs here. All product work is is combining the business outcome with the customer need, and you can do that no matter what role or title you have today. You you can find ways to do that. So stay curious, especially right now. It's <laughs> times are bizarre. The economy's hard. It's super easy to get that tunnel vision on shipping, 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 and projects, and and lose the greater focus on the customer, which is what this whole thing is about anyway. So. My advice would be stay curious. 
Yeah, I'd agree with that. So I don't know if it came through. I'm not a product manager by trade, but um, I'm quite the curious individual, right? I like to play and experiment with different technologies. And I've always approached my career as um, I'm not going to really ask for a lot of permission. Like, I'm just going to go for it. And I think that mentality uh, in your career goes a long way. Like, there's a lot of people I see who, who come in young in their career, start looking for permission. Um, I like to kind of like, you know, try it first and not necessarily, I'm not saying like, don't, don't communicate or anything like that, but just be right. bold, right? Like, um, d don't always worry about asking for permission first. Like, just kind of go grab it. Those are the types of people I think that really thrive and grow inside organizations, right? They, they just kind of have this entrepreneurial um, go-get-it mindset and people notice it, like managers notice it. You get more responsibility, more, um, um, more impact on your organization and next thing you know, you know, uh, your imposter syndrome maybe builds a little bit, but then you're going, right? You're doing it, you're making it happen and you, you learn by doing and, and so just go get it. Amazing. I think we must end on that. Go get it. Thank you very much, speaker. Right. Thank you.